So, um, you know, when you when you walk out in the world today and you were to walk down the street and, and ask somebody at random who they considered might be the most influential person in history, I, I guess you get a variety of answers, you know, um, Aristotle, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, Winston Churchill, Gandhi, Chairman Mao, um, George Washington, any number of names might come up. And yet even the skeptics have to agree that the most influential person and the most influential name in history is that of the name and personage of Jesus, which of course in it itself is probably one of the greatest evidences um, that we have to prove um, the Bible as true, because the story of Jesus and the name of Jesus ha really has no right from his background and upbringing from this, you know, backward place in Judah, Judah, a despised little area, to to have influenced the world as much as he has. Now, I've got a funny feeling this next slide is not going to play. I'm just going to attempt it. Um, and if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I seem to have a problem with it. Um, but we'll see how we go. Uh, no, it's not going to play. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, Proverbs says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous runneth into it and is safe. And I, I really think that right now in lockdown, this is perhaps the most powerful verse in Proverbs because here we are where the world is changing um, really at a dramatic pace. No one, no one could have imagined that in three months we would see such a change to the world. And there's a lot of uncertainty out there. There's a lot of fear. But for those of us that, um, you know, have a confident faith and a belief in the name of Jesus Christ, um, this is going to be our rock and it's going to be our fortress. And, and it's going to help us in our preparations. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 says a good name is better than fine perfume in the bible um when you look at the importance of names um and the amount of times that there is huge significance given to a person's name at the birth of what they might be called um this is just one example of showing that you know many many kings had a great name attached to them. They had the name of God attached to them, but they weren't great kings. Um, Uzziah, who rose up and, and then in his arrogance, he stood against God, didn't really live up to his name. Um, Zedekiah never really lived up to his name. Um, on the other hand, faithful kings like Hezekiah, the strength of Yah, lived, lived up to his name. Um, so, so we have many examples of those that did live up to their names, sometimes even for good and bad. We think about David talking about Nabal and says, as his, as his name is, so he was. He really lived, did live up to his name, and I'm not really quite sure why his mum and dad named him a fool. Um, that's an interesting point for discussion at another time. But Ecclesiastes said a good name is is better than fine perfume but then it goes on to say that the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth because at the end of the day no matter how good the name is um, that's given at birth um, that name is never realized until a person has lived their life until the day of their death a and it's interesting that when you look at the name of fine perfume um, today um, we live in an age where this, this verse in Ecclesiastes perhaps has never had more significant meaning. Um, when you look at the uh, fashion world today, these are some of the fine perfumes that you can buy. 
And um, here are some of the list of the top 10 most expensive perfumes you can buy. So DK, DKNY, which is um, a brand of a New York fashion designer, Donna Karen. Her uh, small bottles of perfume sell for a million dollars per bottle. That's quite a lot of money. To, um, to spend on a bottle of perfume. And when you look down the list, they, uh, they go down. Clive Christian, his sell for $12,000 per ounce. Um, this guy from France, I don't even know how to pronounce that, $6,800 per ounce. And so they go down the list um, in terms of the value of perfume. And what you notice with all of these perfumes, all the top 10 perfumes in the world, is that people spend ridiculous amounts of money to buy that perfume because of the name that's attached to it. And all of these perfumes are, are given a reputation by a person's name. And um, I think there's a stark contrast, isn't there? In, in the Bible when you look at the story of this woman. And, you know, we don't, we don't know what her second name was. We just know her as Mary. Um, but her reputation and her name has lingered through the centuries because she took a uh, one pound of very expensive ointment to the value of 300 pence. And she broke that and anointed Jesus. They say a, a, a penny a day was a day's, uh, a day's wages in the parable of, the, of uh, the man who chose laborers to come and help him in his vineyard. He paid them a penny a day. And whether or not that's accurate uh, as an accurate figure for a, a salary, but if it was, then, you know, essentially perhaps on an average wage, that was worth forty, fifty thousand dollars, and and in a moment she was prepared to sacrifice all of that beautiful perfume, and and because of that, her name lingers on, and the day of her death is remembered long past the life she lived. Um, there's an irony about all of this because when you look at the fashion world. Um, in more recent times, the fashion world has changed dramatically as they've pushed into markets where the money is. So particularly into the Islam, Islamic world to selling to Muslim women, there's been some very high-end fashion designers have seen an opportunity to target what you would think is a strange market where women essentially completely cover their body and cover their faces, and yet they've found a way to actually appeal to that market, and it's been huge for them. What is fascinating is that when you look at the, um, the effects of what's happened with the coronavirus, um, it has hit the heart of all the major... Um, luxuries of the world, all the things that we might consider, consider to be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, and, and perhaps none such more than the fashion world. There's a little um, comment on writing on the effect of the coronavirus. It says, for the outsider, the fashion world with its many mysteries and rituals is often a universe completely disconnected from reality. But when you take a look, you will realize that the fashion designers are the walking prophets of the time we live in. So it's an interesting comment that, you know, fashion design is, is seen as, as a symbol of the walking prophets of our modern age. They guide and they point all, all men in the direction or influence men in the direction they might go. It goes on to say that the fashion world through the events of the coronavirus 
is almost the number one endangered species in this zoo of madness. And it's so true. When you look at where the coronavirus has affected the most, the four pillars of the fashion world sit in, in uh, London, um, Paris, uh, Milan in Italy, and New York. So these are like the four pillars of the fashion world. And when you look at the effect of the coronavirus in those cities, absolutely devastating. Uh, and in the Olivet Prophecy, Jesus says there would be many false prophets that would arise and lead astray many. And because of lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will wax cold. So um, before I um, rave on too much tonight, I'm going to uh, make this a little bit interactive and give you a little bit of a challenge um, in consideration of names. So what I'd like you to do is, um, and some have, may have already done this exercise last time, but if you can uh, look uh, in your bubbles, get together for about five minutes in your bubbles, and just look at Genesis in the first few chapters. And I want you to look carefully at Genesis in the first few chapters. And I want you to find in those first few chapters the things that God names and the things that man names. Now, when I, just to clarify that, there are a number of things that are named, like it talks about four rivers and the names of them are called. That, that's, that's not what I'm referring to. Look carefully for the things that are specifically that it says, and God called or Adam called or man called their name such and such. So have a quick look. And then what you can do in your bubbles is you can uh, text them through on the little text bubble of what you find. So those who have done this before, Maybe you can just keep this to yourselves a little bit. Those who are first time on this, this is your challenge to find all the things that God names and all the things that man names in these first few chapters. Yes, man also named every creature. You don't know what he called them, but that's interesting, isn't it? Isn't it? It's one of the first jobs God gave to man was to name all the animals. So all the cattle and birds came before Adam and he was to give them names. Um, and that was designed to teach Adam that in all of the things of God's creation, there wasn't a, a suitable partner for him. And so as he interacted with all the animals and gave them a name, he found that there was something missing. So that's why God brought uh, or God gave man a help meet in bringing to him a partner. All right, that's 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 great. Thanks, guys. There is um, one other one there in early chapter uh, of chapter two, and that is that not only does man name um, the woman Eve, he actually calls her woman, and that in itself is really interesting because. Uh, the re let's find that verse if I can. Where does it say, man? Verse nineteen. Uh, verse nineteen. Yep. Yeah. Uh, chapter two. Uh, I was. I thought it was. Um, twenty-three. Verse twenty-three. Verse twenty-three. So the man said, "This is." Uh, this is at last, which you can see his um, his exclamation that at last he's found a a suitable help me a partner for him. This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. So he names her woman, which means um, because she was taken out of man now here's something interesting in all the things that god names at the beginning he names by separation so darkness was always there 
it said darkness was on the face of the deep. But God only called light day and darkness night after the introduction of light. So in order to make separation, he gave them names. Now he does that again with land and with sea and with the firmament, the heavens, which sat above the firmament below. So God only names five things. He names light, he calls day, darkness, night, the heavens, and land and sea. Man names Eve, and uh, he names her a woman taken out of man. Now, something's really interesting in this just to think about, and we're going to look at this over the course of our study on the name above every name. But do you notice that there's no record in Genesis 1 and 2 of God naming Adam? In fact, Adam is just introduced into the record. And when we think of how important it is to name something, why is Adam not named in the first two chapters? Well, have a look for a moment and move forward to Genesis chapter 5 because there's a very interesting thing regarding the naming of Adam. And I'm not sure if you've seen this before because I certainly hadn't. But Genesis 5 verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam when God created man. He made them in the likeness of God, male and female. He created them and blessed them and named them man, which is Adam. When God created male and female, he gave them the name Adam. It was man that said she should be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then it was man that gave her the name Eve. But in the beginning, God created them one, which is one of the reasons why Jesus talks about what God has joined, let no man put asunder. Because when he created them, male and female, he gave them a singular name, Adam. That's just someone outside their bubble, sorry. Um, so anyway, I thought that was a, a bit of an interesting exercise for all. Um, now I'm just going to come back to uh, my sharing my screen again now and just quickly summarize a couple of those things. So um, God called, I'm not quite sure why all my little video links aren't working at the moment. I have to check my settings on my program. Anyway, God called the firmament heaven and the evening and morning with a second day. So as I said, in, in the beginning, God created Adam and Eve one and and gave them a singular name. Uh, and this is this is interesting into our story about the name above every name and what the name of Jesus really represents. And we had this in our exhortation this morning by Reese talking about unity. It's really the heart of what the name of Jesus is all about, making one. In fact, when we think about um, Jesus, we think about the word atonement which is made up of a compound word at one meant. Uh, and, and the life of Jesus is all about um, making, uh, breaking down um, oppositions and walls of petition and things that divide and unifying. And so the life of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus, which started 2000 years ago, has had a major influence on the world. And, and I just want you to think about a few things just quickly. When, when Jesus gave a parable about the mustard seed, um, he said the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in the field, which indeed is the smallest of all other seeds, but when it's grown, it's greater than all the garden plants. And, and mustard seed, I, I don't know if you know, it, it's, 
it's essentially um, a garden herb, but it's almost like a weed in the sense that once it starts growing, it takes over. Um, and, and it's a little bit like a virus that can take over the ground. And if it's not controlled, it can consume everything in its path. And, and Jesus said that this gospel, this kingdom of heaven, this teaching is going to be like a grain of mustard seed. And when you think about where it started from, here was Jesus who was, you know, born in Bethlehem, grew up in a little place called Nazareth, which is just the back end of nowhere. Um, I, I, I keep thinking of maybe um, Kai Koei, sorry, Lois Sandal, if you're here, or uh, uh, it, it's very much like the nowhere part of of New Zealand. Well, out of that came this man who had such a huge influence and this gospel has now spread through all the world. And he said it would grow like a grain of mustard seed and when it grew, all the birds would come and make their perch in it. In other words, this gospel was going to be a place which would be a haven for all of God's creatures. It was going to be a message which would bring life and which would bring hope. Um, and, and wherever you look in the story of the preaching of the gospel that started way back in that first century, we can see the influence that Jesus has had on the world. So um, just move that, oops, sorry. I can't play that again. I keep getting this. Uh, green in my way. <laughs> okay, so um, this is this is a quote by a um, an Anglican minister uh, back in the 1800s. Um, and he made a comment of Jesus that he's the greatest influence in the world today and said there's a fifth gospel being written the work of Jesus Christ in the hearts and the lives of men. And then there's um, another poem which um, is incredibly powerful, written around the same time, which goes like this. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant. He grew up in another village where he worked as a carpenter until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a home. He didn't go to college. He never lived in a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place he was born. He did none of the things that would normally accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through a mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his garments, the only property he owned on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. 20 centuries have come and gone. And today, he is the central figure of the human race. I'm well within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. And it, it, it's so true, isn't it? To me, this is one of the most powerful examples of the evidence of the Bible. It, it, there is just no right or reason, no rhyme or reason why the name of Jesus and the influence of his teaching should, should have influenced our world. But it really has, and it has for so many good things. You know, Jesus' teaching towards children, the, 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 the time in the gospel where he said, leave little children alone and don't forbid them to come to me for the kingdom of heaven belongs such as these for for hundreds of years the attitude towards kids in the ancient culture was absolutely barbaric um children weren't 
really even considered to be worthy of, of life until they had grown to a mature age. And so kids, uh, even like in many countries today, sadly, and the impoverished are exploited and abandoned and often killed and traded to the evilest of men. And, and that existed in the days of Jesus through the Greco-Roman world, but it was through Jesus' teaching and, and this book here written by, by this, uh, this guy, Bake, who wrote a story when children became people, talks about the Christian influence which changed um, the darkest age of the world where children weren't given any credence. So whether it was children or whether it is human rights, you think about the influence of Jesus across human rights. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free, male or female. You know, um, Jesus' influence, uh, particularly on, on um, the slave and the free, um, but the equal opportunities that people should have in a life in Christ was taught through his interaction and his dealing with every class of people. And, and so people like William Wilberforce, perhaps many of you have seen the movie Amazing Grace, which came out a number of years ago, the true story of the influence that Wilbur, Wilberforce had on the abolition of slavery. Um, that's his statue outside Westminster Abbey. Um, he committed his life to, um, to the abolition of slavery. And in 1833, of course, that act was passed it would then go on and affect America. But it was all upon Christian principles, that it was through the teachings of Christ that people shouldn't have the right to own slaves, to have people as personal chattels. Jesus' teaching in regards to the role of women was absolutely outstanding. His interaction with women was way ahead of its time. And I think that influenced a lot of the apostles' teaching. Um, one of the, these quotes in Timothy, which is taken from an extremely literal translation of the Greek, and I believe an incredibly accurate one, but again, a topic for another time to discuss. Um, this is a translation from the uh, revised English version, which says, a woman must learn and be learning without causing disturbance. Now, that might sound you know, with all subjugation, that might sound like something that, you know, Paul's often accused of being, you know, a male chauvinist. But, but this was so ahead of its time because whether it was Jewish, whether it was Greek, whether it was Roman culture, the attitudes towards women and education is much the same as it exists in Islam today. Um, they weren't permitted to learn. And so when you see pictures like this in the story of Mary and Martha in the house of Lazarus, which you might be familiar with in John chapter 11, Martha's indignant at Mary because she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. I had always thought it was because she thought, you know, her sister was being lazy and she needed a hand. But there's far more to that story. It's the fact that in 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 the culture of Jesus' day, it just wasn't permitted for women to sit and to learn at the feet of a rabbi. And she, as she was busying herself, she just thought it wasn't right that Jesus was allowing Mary this position, this privileged, honored position. And Jesus, of course, would go on to say, leave her alone because she has chosen that good part. Totally radical teaching, teaching that changed the world in his day and still influences our world today. So when you look at education and, and the, the greatest names within education, every single one of these universities and all the ancient universities, Oxford dates back, you know, a thousand years, University of Cambridge, Princeton, Harvard, they were all established and built upon Christian principles in the belief that a person should have the opportunity to love the Lord with all their heart with all their soul and with all their mind. And if you looked at art, literature, music, sculpture, there's been more artists, more composers, more writers, more sculptures giving glory to Jesus than all famous people put together. More things have been written about Jesus than any other identity by anyone. If you look at the... the um, the services which have affected the world in terms of compassion and today right now with 
what's happening with the coronavirus. My son's on the front line for St. John's out there, putting his life at risk um, and doing an incredible service. So whether you look at Samaritan, St. John's, Red Cross, Good Shepherd Services, they are all built upon the stories of Jesus, of compassion and love, of being able to sacrifice your own personal well-being and fears to save other people. The Red Cross was set up by Henry Dunant to Calvinists. The Order of St. John's goes back a thousand years AD, the time of the Crusades when they set up a place for Christian pilgrims and they went to Jerusalem, had the first seen eye hospital in the world. Huge influence upon the world. And as a leader, this was unheard of. You know, you, you can see Jesus' spirit of compassion and forgiveness all through the Bible record. Perhaps this one is a great example with a woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. Condemned under the law, it was a black and white case. And Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, aware of they, has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And he said, neither do I condemn thee. This spirit of forgiveness and compassion has been an enormous influence on world leaders today. And the Western world was changed and was influenced so much by the love and teaching that Jesus taught. In comparison to this, you can look at the legacy of people like this man, Genghis Khan. There in Mongolia is this enormous tribute to Genghis Khan. And here's one of his famous statements. The greatest happiness is to scatter your enemy, to drive him before you, to see his cities reduced to ashes, and to see those who love him shrouded in tears, and to gather into your bosom his wives and his children. That's what people in Genghis Khan saw as greatness. Oh, the difference to a man that said, love your enemies. And this is so true. Only love stops hate. And Jesus taught that principle. But I say unto you, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. So when we look at the Christian world today, the influence of the name of Jesus, you've got one third of the world that is Christian. But you know, if you add to that the Muslim world, one third of the world is Muslims. And I don't, people don't realize the influence that Jesus has on Muslim teaching. So um, this, uh, these writings about Jesus um, are found in, in the Quran. Jesus is mentioned specifically by name in 25 different verses of the Quran. He is described multi a multitude of times as the word, the spirit of God. Um, no other prophet in the Quran, not even Muhammad, is given the honor that Jesus is given. He is the most named and recognized identity uh, within the Quran. And so even within Muslim teaching, the belief of the virgin birth, the belief of Jesus performing miracles. And so this little, this little quote here, um, which was taken from the Muslims British Council, uh, headed by a, um, a Muslim called Magra, says, we don't have to fight over Jesus. He is special for Christians and Muslims. He is bigger than life. We can share him. And so if you if you take the influence and I know that, you know, within Islam, there are, you know, fanatical left and right wings of Quran, but of, of Islam, it's not dissimilar to Christianity when you think about it. You know, we had we had years of through the dark ages where, you know, through the persecution of, of the believers and um, through Catholic inquisition um, of, of the radical side who who twisted the teachings of Jesus but 
even within the Quran are some of the most valued principles of forgiveness and compassion and loving your enemies. And they come from the teachings of Jesus. And perhaps this story here, um, I find to be one of the most incredible stories that I've ever heard. And um, what I'm, I think, maybe I can't, I promised to put this up last time. I'll do it again at the end of this if I can remember. Um, these two chaps, these two gentlemen, Azim Kamiza and Please Felix, are very interesting gentlemen. Um, Azim Kamiza, he's a Sufi Muslim, and Sufi Muslims are perhaps the most, you might call, middle of the road, um, balanced, if you like. They take the um, the peaceful principles taught in Islam and in the Quran, and really believe in the principles of meditation, um, of compassion, of love, um, and of kindness. And Tess Felix, he he's a Baptist preacher, and um, they formed an incredible friendship and an incredible bond together. Christianity and Islam. But what's amazing about how they formed that friendship is that they together started a foundation called the Tariq Kamisa Foundation. Tariq Kamisa was Azim's 20 year old son. He was shot and killed in 1995 when he was only 20 years. He was a bright student and he was shot and killed by a 14 year old boy. He was lured to deliver pizza into a gang initiation and when he got there, this 14 year old boy was enticed by his friends to, uh, to kill him. And he shot and killed him and it was the first case in US history where a 14 year old was tried as an adult and Tony Hicks, the boy that was 14, was given a 25 year old sentence. Uh, sorry, a 25-year sentence. As you can imagine, for Azim, his world came crashing down in a moment. Nothing could have prepared him for what had happened. He said it was just like an ex tsunami of grief. It was like a nuclear explosion just went off inside him. And he had to, of course, explain to his wife, uh, Tariq's mother, that their only child had been shot and killed. Um, Azim spent a long time trying to come to terms with it and he did so through the power of meditation and through principles of compassion and forgiveness and after some time he decided to reach out to the caregiver of tony hicks who was his grandfather please felix the man next to him and between the two of them they forged a friendship and he learned tony's story that this poor boy at the age of 14 was subjected to being pushed from foster home to foster home. He wasn't brought up in a good environment. And Police Felix had taken him as un, under his wing as a last, as a loving grandfather to try to give him an education and try to bring him up on right principles. But the damage already done to Tony was such that he was already involved with gangs. And it led him down a path which caused them to murder someone at just 14 years old. Azim went further and decided to go and meet Tony in prison. When he met Tony in prison, he thought he was going to look into the eyes of a stone cold killer. Instead, he looked through the eyes and he saw a young boy who was scared and afraid and a young boy who was steeped in guilt and hated himself for the things he had done. And through the compassion of love and forgiveness, they helped Tony through a very difficult time in prison. And Tony uh, is out of prison this year and joins police and Azim in working together in, um, in their foundation, which is built upon a principle for stopping children, killing children, and stopping crime in American schools. And um, Azim's written a number of books, but books written on principles which we would completely say amen and amen to. The belief that sustained acts of kindness lead to sustained acts of friendship. Sustained acts of friendship leads to trust. Trust 
uh, sustained trust leads to empathy and sustained empathy leads to compassion and compassion finally ends in peace where a person finds meaning in life. This is all from the itinerant preacher who at the age of 30 walked around the streets of Nazareth with a group of fishermen and started teaching principles about life. And those teachings have reached to the four corners of the earth and today they still influence society. You know, the greatest sign I believe of the end of the age is this one. And it comes right after that quote in Matthew 24 that we read earlier about the false prophets that shall arise in the last days and that it says of all the things that we will witness in the last time Jesus said there'll be signs with earthquakes famines wars and pestilences and we've seen them all but he said when you see this gospel of the kingdom proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, then the end shall come. And never before have we seen the fulfillment of that verse more than in the last 10 years. Um, and hopefully this little video I'm gonna show is gonna work because this one really is kind of cool. So, oh, I don't know why that's not working. That's a shame. Um, this, little, this little video clip that I had here, um, it shows the spread of Christianity in the time at the beginning of the Roman Empire, and it shows it's waxing and waning through all the different epochs of time in the last 2000 years. It shows the kingdoms that have risen and fallen at the same time Christianity is slowly growing. And you can see Christianity waxes and wanes. But as it gets to the last 10 years, it's incredible. We see the gospel just preached to the furthest parts of the world. And um, I guess uh, I was hoping that maybe my dear brother, and I'm just quickly looking down the list. No, he hasn't joined me. He's still out shopping which is a bit of a shame. So uh, I, I sent a message to my dear brother, Carl Belush in Finland, and I asked him if he would like to join us. And he said, if he gets back in time, he would love to join us. But, you know, I, I think it's an amazing story that um, I met Carl in Pakistan in 2010. We formed a friendship that uh, we built for the last 10 years and um, I, I've managed to um, see him again in Sri Lanka numerous times and then remarkably God um, caused Carl to end up in Finland and I don't think Finland could be further away from Auckland New Zealand I think probably that's that's pretty much one end of the earth to the other and right now, Carl is doing an incredible good job in witnessing and preaching the gospel in Finland. And I believe the gospel has reached the four corners of the earth. And I think what we're seeing is the gospel was greater than any virus that exists. And um, oh, thank you there, uh, Zach. He's already got the YouTube link up for the story of Tarim. So, um, so that that has spread to the four corners of the earth. So um, that was an introduction really into the story of the name of Jesus. Um, but I want to sort of talk uh, just briefly about um, where I'm going with this series in terms of the name above every name. So this is a quote we um, we all all know really well um, we use it uh, a lot in baptisms which is why i've got that lovely picture of the uh, turtle there coming out of the water because i think that's a great apt illustration of baptism he's coming out of his shell and the light's shining on his face and i think this is kind of a cool little description of numbers chapter six so numbers numbers Chapter 6, verse 24 to 26, 
is um, the story of the blessings of the sons of Aaron. Um, but more than just the blessing of the sons of Aaron, it's the blessing of the nation of Israel. And it says in Numbers 6, verse 24 to 26, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious to thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And in this statement, there's some really interesting um, components of this blessing, what's represented in this blessing. So what we often don't do when we read this verse is read the next verse. And I actually think we miss the power of this blessing by not reading the next verse. So if you're in Numbers chapter 6, have a look at the very next verse after this. I'll read that again, verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. And I think in this blessing is the key to the name of God. And I'm not talking about dissecting the, the name of Yahweh and giving um, a, a dissertation on the I will be or I am that I am. It's about what's behind the name of Yahweh. God's name is made up. It's a covenant name and it's made up of a promise. And the promise is this promise here. I will bless thee and keep thee. I will make my his face to shine upon thee and be gracious to thee. And the Lord will lift up his countenance upon thee and will give thee peace. And what we're going to see is that that, in fact, is seen in its total fulfillment in the story of the man, Jesus, who came and dwelt amongst us. So finally, 